Hello, welcome to lecture 20 of Solitons. In the last few lectures, uh, uh, we were hoping to find uh, multi-soliton solutions of the KDV equation. And we did that by following a method uh, introduced by Hirota in the late 70s. And that went through the uh, reformulation of the KDV equation where the KDV equation could be written in terms of a, a new field F where I remind you the KDV field was equal to two the second partial derivative of the logarithm of f with respect to x. And then for this new uh, field f, uh, the KDV equation could be rewritten in this bilinear form, b of f comma f equals zero, where b was the bilinear uh, Hirota differential operator dt dx plus dx to the fourth. And what we discussed last time is that uh, Hirota looked for a power series solution of this equation, uh, which is a series in an auxiliary parameter epsilon, where uh, the leading constant term is taken to be equal to one that would correspond to uh, the vacuum solution. And then uh, we hope that this series truncates at the finite value of a uh, uh, small n that we will call capital N, so that eventually we can take uh, the auxiliary parameter epsilon to be finite, uh, since we don't need to worry about convergence, uh, uh, we just have a polynomial. And in particular, we can set it uh, to be equal to one. An advantage of looking for a, a power series solution is that we could uh, solve the equation order by order in uh, powers of epsilon. And that uh, uh, gave us a recursion relation that I called here equation n, whereby if we know all the f up to a certain order, say uh, n minus one, so uh, f1, f2, f3, up to fn minus one, then we can solve this equation to determine fn, the next, uh, um, the coefficient of the next order in the expansion and so on and so forth. And then I told you that uh, uh, a simple solution uh, of the first uh, equation, equation one is that f1 is a, a sum of uh, exponentials of uh, linear functions of x and t where the coefficients of a of x and the coefficient of t are related in such a way. So this is what we uh, usually call exponentials of theta i. So we see that uh, if we take that uh, as a solution of uh, equation one, um, then uh, we find uh, uh, the higher coefficients fn in the power series expansion of, of f uh, uh, in powers of epsilon. And we find that the expansion terminates at order epsilon to the capital N where capital N was the uh, uh, number of summons uh, in the uh, expression for uh, F1. And uh, uh, when you plug it back uh, in the original KDV equation, this is nothing but uh, the n soliton solution of the KDV equation. And at the end of uh, the last lecture, we uh, specialized this to capital N uh, equal to two. So that would be the two soliton solution. And we found the solution written in equation 6.39. Uh, which in the problems class uh, we um, analyze a bit further. And if you finish that uh, uh, problem 40 that we started discussing in the problems class, that would prove uh, indeed that there are no higher order uh, terms in the expansion of F in powers of epsilon. So today I would like to do uh, two things to conclude this term. So first, uh, um, I will sketch uh, what the general solution uh, for general N uh, looks like. That would be the n soliton solution. I will not derive it, but I just give uh, uh, some plausible arguments based on the form of the n equal to soliton solutions. And finally, I will uh, uh, investigate uh, the two soliton solution further, and we look uh, again at the asymptotics in commoving frames in the same way that we analyze uh, soliton solutions of the sine Gordon equation, and we'll see that indeed. It contains uh, uh, two solitons, um, and we will be able to calculate uh, their phase shifts. Okay, so let's try to say a bit more about uh, general n. To motivate the solution for general n, let's uh, first massage. Uh, the two soliton solution in equation 6.39. 
So I'll write it in the following form. F is equal to one plus uh, epsilon exponential of theta one times one plus x epsilon exponential of theta two. Then uh, if I compare with the first uh, three terms in 6.39, I need to subtract uh, epsilon squared e to the theta one plus theta two. And finally, I need to add the, the last term epsilon squared a one minus a two over a one plus a two squared exponential of theta one plus theta two. And now I'm gonna group together uh, the two terms at order epsilon squared. So I'll first rewrite uh, the initial term. And at order epsilon squared, let me write this as minus epsilon squared, then we'll have uh, exponential of theta one plus theta two. And the dependence on uh, a one plus a two uh, has uh, a one plus uh, a two squared in the denominator and in the numerator I have uh, a1 plus a2 squared minus a1 minus a2 squared so that's for a1 a2 and the nice thing uh, about this rewriting is that uh, uh, we can rewrite this expression as a determinant uh, so here I'll rewrite this as the determinant as the following matrix where I have in the diagonal one plus epsilon e to the theta one and one plus epsilon e to the theta two. So that when I multiply them, I get uh, uh, the first term uh, in the previous line. And then uh, uh, the second term, uh, we take it to come from the product of the off diagonal terms. Uh, there is some ambiguity in how I split them up, but let me split them up in the following way. So I'll have epsilon times two A1 over A1 plus A2 times exponential of theta two in the one two entry and then epsilon times two A2 over A1 plus A2 exponential of theta one in the two one entry. So what we learn here is that we can write F for the two soliton solution as the determinant uh, of a two by two matrix S. Where uh, the matrix element Sij is given by the following expression. Let's first set epsilon uh, equal to zero. Then I get that the matrix S is the identity matrix. So I get the Kronecker delta Ij for the entries of uh, the identity matrix. And then uh, there are some extra terms which are linear in epsilon and for entry ij we get uh, 2 ai over ai plus aj times exponential of theta j where here i and j um, are equal to one or two. So we're considering a two by two matrix S for the two soliton solution. So let me make a brief comment here. Uh, I said earlier that there is some ambiguity in how um, I split the terms in particular in uh, equation 6.40, if I write uh, e to the theta i instead of e to the theta j for the Sij matrix element, then uh, I get the same determinant, but uh, we'll stick to 6.40. Good, so for the two soliton solution, we can write uh, the function f that appears in the bilinear form of the KDV equation as a determinant of a two by two matrix S, um, which is uh, linear in the auxiliary parameter epsilon and uh, uh, depends on the parameters AI and uh, on the exponentials uh, e to the theta j as in 6.40. So the nice thing of this uh, rewriting is that uh, this formula 6.40 actually generalizes to higher n.
with the S and N by N matrix, of the same form uh, as in 6.40, except that uh, i and j now run from one to n. And this is the n soliton solution of KDV. So this can be proven uh, by induction. Uh, for instance, uh, I will not uh, go through the proof, but uh, uh, you can uh, look at the reference uh, if you're interested. Finally, let me mention that uh, by using the definition uh, of the determinant, one can also show that uh, for the n soliton solution, uh, f uh, n, small n, uh, which is uh, the order epsilon to the small n term in the uh, expansion of uh, the f uh, or equivalently determinant of s in powers of epsilon takes the following form. So we have a sum over uh, small n indices, uh, i1 less than i2 less than i3 less than i small n between one and capital N. So these are uh, all indices and we can take them uh, to be ordered. Otherwise uh, you write uh, just uh, one over N factorial in front. And then we have uh, uh, for epsilon to the power small n, we need to have uh, a product of uh, uh, small n uh, exponentials of uh, uh, theta uh, i. So this is, uh, will be theta i1 plus theta i2 up to theta i n. And that, that will multiply a product of rational functions in the uh, parameters a i, which can be written as a product uh, over j less than k between one uh, and small n of a i j minus a i k over a i j plus a i k all squared. This is uh, a little technical, uh, but uh, essentially to get here, you just need to use uh, the definition of uh, uh, the determinant of a matrix and uh, a few manipulations. Anyway, you can try and derive this formula if you're interested. Uh, the, uh, my main point here is that uh, there is a very explicit formula for uh, the coefficients uh, uh, in this uh, power series uh, expansion in epsilon of uh, f. And so the n soliton solution can be written uh, in a very explicit way. That's all I wanted to say about the n soliton solution of the KDV equation. Next, uh, uh, we will study the two soliton solution uh, uh, that we derived last time uh, a bit further. And we will show that indeed uh, it contains uh, two KDV solitons. This takes us to the final section, section 6.4 on uh, asymptotics of the two soliton solution of KDV. and calculation of uh, phase shifts. To see that the two soliton solutions six point thirty nine uh, contains indeed the uh, two solitons. will follow the same logic uh, as in section uh, 5.7, 
which was about the two soliton solution of sine Gordon. Namely, uh, we will uh, switch to an appropriate commoving frame, which moves uh, together with one or the other soliton. And only then will take time to go to plus or minus infinity. Recall that the two soliton solution was given in terms of the function f by one plus exponential of theta one plus exponential of theta two plus capital A exponential of theta one plus theta two where theta i was equal to a i x minus a i cube t plus c i where a i and c i are constant and the coefficient capital a is uh, a one minus a two over a one plus a two squared and uh, notice that we need a one different from a2 or the solution will not uh, make sense. In fact, A1 different uh, from plus and minus uh, A2. And I set the parameter epsilon, the auxiliary parameter to one or alternatively I absorb it uh, by a shift uh, of the constant CI. Good, this is the content of the two soliton solution in terms of the function F. So next uh, I'll take uh, the parameters A1 and A2 to be positive and I'll take uh, A1 to be less than A2. And I claim that this is without loss of generality. And so a question for you is to understand uh, why that's the case. So this means that uh, um, the one soliton solution with f given by one plus e to the theta one will have a velocity one equal to a one squared. On the other hand, the one soliton solution given by f equal uh, uh, one plus uh, e to the theta two will have velocity v two equal to a two squared, uh, which is larger. And as we'll see later, these are precisely the two solitons which are contained in this solution, uh, hopefully this will not be surprising. So what we'll do is uh, uh, we will follow the slower soliton first. Namely, we'll switch to a commoving frame which moves at velocity uh, v1 or a1 squared. So the special coordinate will be x a1 squared, which is small x minus a1 squared t. And we'll keep this uh, coordinate fixed and take uh, time t to plus and minus infinity. This is uh, precisely what we did for the sine Gordon equation. Okay, then uh, in this commoving frame, uh, we can rewrite uh, theta one and theta two. And theta one uh, uh, will be constant or fixed. That would be equal to A one times the special commoving coordinate capital X A one squared plus C one, whereas theta two will be given by A two times the special commoving coordinate X A one squared. And then uh, I'll need to subtract uh, A two squared minus A one squared times T to reproduce uh, the original expression for theta two. And in fact, I also need the constant C two. And now since uh, a2 squared is larger than a1 squared, we see that uh, the term uh, which multiplies t uh, is negative. And so when we take 
t to infinity to plus infinity with the capital X fix, we see that theta one stays fixed and finite and theta two goes to minus infinity because the coefficient of t is negative. And so the function f in this limit uh, is uh, approximately equal to one plus e to the theta one because the third and the fourth term up here uh, tend to zero. So what we found is that in the limit uh, where t goes to plus infinity in this co-moving frame, which moves uh, at velocity a one squared, we find uh, that f is equal to one plus uh, e to the theta one, which is nothing but uh, a one soliton solution centered at uh, a one squared times t minus c one over a1. This is what uh, we obtain when we rewrite uh, theta 1 as uh, a1 times x minus a1 squared t plus uh, c1 over a1. On the other hand, when t goes to minus infinity, we have that uh, theta one again stays finite or is fixed in this limit where as theta two goes now to plus infinity. And so when we look at uh, the expression for f, which I've copied up there, we see that it's the third and the fourth term, which are now uh, the leading terms. Whereas uh, the first two terms uh, um, are subleading and uh, will be neglected. So if I uh, factor out the exponential of theta two, I'll get that f is approximately exponential of theta two times one plus a exponential of theta one. But now recall that u, the KDV field, was given by twice the second partial x derivative of the logarithm of f, which given uh, the previous uh, asymptotic expression for f is twice second partial x derivative of uh, the logarithm of the product is a sum of logarithm. And so we get the logarithm of e to the theta two, which is simply theta two plus the logarithm of one plus a e to the theta one. And now we notice that uh, um, theta two was uh, linear in x. So partial derivative with respect to x, uh, two times of theta two, it's zero. And so we simply get that this is twice the second partial derivative with respect to x of the logarithm of one plus a exponential of theta one, which uh, I can rewrite uh, in terms of the original coordinates as twice second partial derivative with respect to x of the logarithm of one plus exponential of theta one that was a one x minus a one cube t plus c one. And then the prefactor a becomes a logarithm of a in the exponent. And now we recognize that uh, this is nothing but uh, again, a one soliton uh, solution with velocity a one squared centered at uh, time t at the position um, a1 squared t minus c1 plus logarithm of a over a1. So 
So this is what we find when t goes to minus infinity. And uh, recall that when t goes to plus infinity, we found instead the one soliton solution centered at a1 square t minus c1 over a1. If we compare the two trajectories at uh, uh, late times, uh, time goes to plus infinity and early times time goes to minus infinity in equation 6.44 and 6.46, we find uh, therefore that uh, the slower soliton which had the velocity v1 equal a1 squared has a phase shift given by the difference of 6.44 and 6.46. So this is one over a1 times the logarithm of uh, big A, which we can rewrite in terms of um, A1 and A2 as uh, 1 over A1 and then uh, big A was A1 minus A2 over A1 plus A2 squared. So I'll write everything as the uh, logarithm of uh, A2 plus a1 over A2 minus A1 in absolute value. Um, and then we had the square that I'll write as a two in front uh, of the logarithm. And then I also took an inverse, so I get the minus sign. Okay, so this is just algebra, but the point of this is that uh, since uh, A2 is larger than A1, then the argument of the logarithm is larger than one from which uh, we deduce that the phase shift of the slower soliton is negative. We can similarly follow the faster soliton which uh, moves in the original frame with velocity v2 equal to a2 squared. So in this case, uh, um, the special uh, coordinate in the co-moving frame is capital X a2 squared, which is defined by uh, small x, the original special coordinate minus a2 squared times t. And we'll keep uh, this combination fixed uh, and take the limit where time goes to plus or minus infinity. Then in this uh, co-moving frame, we can rewrite theta one and theta two as follows. So first theta two now will be um, fixed. That will be given by A2 capital X A2 squared plus C2, whereas theta one, which was equal to A1 X minus A1 cubed T uh, plus C1, we can rewrite that as A1 times capital X A2 squared. And then we'll have to subtract uh, A1 squared minus A2 squared, which multiplies T uh, and add the constant C1 to get uh, the original expression a1x minus a1 cubed t plus c1. Where now we notice that a1 squared minus a2 squared is negative because we assume that a2 was larger than a1 and a1 is positive and so the coefficient of t is now positive. Here we are again. 
And now we take the two limits in 6.48 in the co-moving frame. And let's first take t to minus infinity. Now, in that case, uh, since the coefficient of t in theta one uh, is positive, we get that theta one goes to minus infinity, whereas theta two stays finite or fixed. And so the function f, uh, uh, which was given by one plus uh, e to the theta one plus e to the theta two plus capital A e to the theta one plus theta two is now approximately equal to one plus e to the theta two. And this is nothing but uh, uh, one soliton moving with velocity a two squared centered at um, a2 squared times t minus c2 over a2 at time t. This was uh, the easier of the two limits. On the other hand, when time goes to plus infinity in this co-moving frame, then theta one goes to plus infinity, theta two stays fixed. And what we find is that f is uh, approximately given by e to the theta one times one plus capital A e to the theta two, analogously to what we found uh, earlier for the other soliton, which uh, once again describes uh, uh, one soliton solution of the KDV equation moving uh, uh, in the original uh, frame with coordinates uh, x and t at velocity a two squared uh, which moves along uh, the following trajectory. A2 squared of t minus C2 plus logarithm of A over A2. This is for the same reason as above for the other soliton, namely the prefactor e to the theta one in f um, does not play a role uh, um, for the purpose of calculating the KDV field u. And uh, the coefficient capital A of exponential of theta two is what is responsible for the shift by logarithm of A in 6.51. And so now, uh, if we compare the trajectory of this soliton uh, uh, moving uh, with velocity a2 squared in the original frame at uh, late times uh, given by 6.51 and early times given by 6.50, we find that uh, the faster soliton which move with velocity v2 equal a2 squared has a phase shift given by 6.51 minus 6.50. So this is now minus one over A2 logarithm of capital A, which we can rewrite in terms of the uh, parameters a2 and a1 as uh, now plus two over a2 logarithm of a2 plus a1 over a2 minus a1, which is still positive. So now we get a positive uh, phase shift. For the faster soliton. So to summarize the picture that uh, we obtained from the analysis of the asymptotics of the two soliton solution uh, is the following. For finite times, uh, this asymptotic analysis uh, cannot tell us much. So we know that the collision will take place, but uh, to find out what uh, happens uh, precisely, we'll have to look uh, at the exact solution. Uh, which I'll do in a minute. But just by looking at the asymptotics, uh, uh, we can identify 
two solid ones uh, uh, in the solution, uh, both at uh, early times and at late times. So there will be a faster soliton and a slower soliton, which move uh, velocities uh, a2 squared and a1 squared respectively. So remember that uh, KDV solitons uh, uh, move to the right, so the velocity is positive. So this is t going to minus infinity. And the two solitons appear in the solution uh, at uh, late times, t going to plus infinity. So with the same shapes and velocities, but uh, the faster soliton is advanced. and the slower soliton is retarded. So what this shows is that uh, indeed uh, the solitons uh, of um, the KDV equation that we derived uh, earlier in the terms as uh, traveling wave solutions uh, uh, obey the third defining property of uh, a soliton Namely, uh, when they collide with uh, other solitons, they reemerge uh, from the collision uh, with the same shapes and velocities. The only effect uh, of the collision is in the phase shift, uh, which uh, in this case advances the faster soliton and retards uh, the slower soliton. Indeed, KDV solitons obey property three. They emerge from collisions with the same shapes and velocities. They are only affected by a phase shift. And now to conclude, let's look at a few plots of the exact two soliton solutions, which uh, as we will see in a second, uh, will confirm uh, uh, the asymptotic analysis uh, that uh, we've just carried out. Let's start with a plot of a two soliton solution of the KDV equation with the parameters a1 equal to 0.7 and a2 equal one. If you change the values of the parameters, the solution looks qualitatively very similar. So what we see here is this is space, this is time, and vertically I'm plotting the value of the KDV field u. So we can uh, clearly see here the two KDV solitons. So this is a faster soliton, which is behind uh, at early times. And this is the slower soliton, uh, which is also uh, wider and that's ahead uh, at early times. At a finite value of t, the two solitons collide. And then at late times, you see that the faster soliton is ahead uh, uh, of the slower soliton. And in particular, you can see already from here that the slower soliton is retarded. So the effect of the collision is to shift it backwards, whereas uh, uh, this might be slightly harder to see. But uh, the faster soliton is advanced, so the effect of the collision is to move it uh, forward a little bit. That's uh, perhaps clear if we look at the contour plot uh, of the energy density, where here is uh, faster soliton, and this is the slower soliton. So you can clearly see again that uh, the slower soliton is shifted backwards. Uh, it has a negative phase shift uh, because of the collision with the other soliton, whereas uh, the faster soliton would have been somewhere here in the absence of the slower soliton. So we see that the collision uh, shifts it forward. So that's a positive phase shift. 
And we can also see from this uh, contour plot of the energy density that uh, uh, the two solitons seem to get uh, further apart uh, during the collision. And so that uh, suggests that uh, uh, 2K dV solitons repel each other. And finally, um, as usual, it looks like uh, the two solitons uh, are swapping their identities uh, uh, in the middle of the collision. So you could think of uh, this as being one trajectory and this as being another trajectory where the identity of the soliton is uh, swapped uh, during the collision. So finally, uh, let's look at the uh, animation of the time evolution. So here we are. So we can see the faster and taller, narrower soliton catching up with the slower soliton and eventually overtaking it. And if you look carefully, you can see that uh, the faster soliton is advanced by the collision, whereas the slower soliton is retarded. That's all I had to say for this term. So thank you for your attention. And I'll now pass the baton uh, to Patrick Dory, who uh, next term will uh, explain to you um, the so-called inverse scattering method, which is a general method to find uh, a general solution of uh, equations like uh, the KDV equation, starting from uh, any initial condition. And uh, in addition to that, and along the way, you will also learn a, a new formalism, which is called the Laxa pair formalism that will allow you to understand a bit better uh, what makes uh, equations of the so-called integrable type like the KDV equation or the sine Gordon equation so special. That's all folks, uh, have a good winter break and bye-bye.